Are you a low elo player who gets overwhelmed and flustered by just all of the different region choices that you have in TFT? Or are you a competitive player who wants to get that little edge and learn how to play every single region to the absolute fullest, the maximum potential so that you can try and go first more often? Or maybe you're just somewhere in between. Well, then this video is exactly what you have been looking for because today I'm going to be going over all of the regions there are in TFT and I'm gonna be giving you a challenger insight and show you how I think about each of the regions and giving you some tips about how you can maximize your chance of going first in each and every single region. So let's get into it. Okay, so starting out with Scuttle Puddle, of course, most people know by now that if you play one unit, you can guarantee 10 gold on one three, which means that you can play that one unit again and then get 20 gold on one four. Now, this is great for an open fort strategy where you're going to have a lot of econ and then you can roll back down later. But the only time I do this is when I don't get any high value pairs, as usually it's better to just hold on to those other pairs, still make 10 gold. However, you want to try and get some upgrades so that you can try and streak during stage two. A lot of other players are going to be making 20. So usually it's quite easy to streak if you just get a couple of upgrades and a good combat augment and there's nothing wrong with playing for a five streak as you'll actually save a lot of hp and make even more money because you'll be getting that streaking gold as well as the gold you get from actually winning the rounds when you're playing in this region there's a lot of reroll comps that you can technically play because when you hyper roll on level four at four one you can roll down for your three star one cost but you don't actually have to send it all the way down to zero gold usually you should aim to hit with around 30 to 50 gold left and this will enable you to push levels so a lot of the times people if they get a lot of lucky shops in the early game will play around the one cost rerolls Otherwise, in this region, you can pretty much do whatever you want, but most of the time, you're going to have enough gold to go for a level 7, 3, 5 all-in, or you can go for a fast 8 on 4, 2. Just keep in mind, if you're in that awkward tempo where you don't roll on 3, 5, if you do a level 7 all-in on 4, 1, a lot of the time, all of the four costs that you want are going to be gone. So just make sure that you're scouting when you're determining whether or not you need to do a 3-5 all-in or a 4-2, as 4-1's usually a little bit awkward in this region. And you should always be looking to cap on level 9, because after the 5-1 uh, extra money you get from Scuttle Puddle, you should look, be looking to try and get to level 9 sometime in stage 5 at the absolute latest 6-1. In Yumi Zoom Zone, re-rolling isn't going to be as good, just because all of the fast 8 players are going to be able to get there so much easier, as you're going to be obviously getting a lot more experience. Uh, something to note is that it's really easy to get to level nine in these games. So a win con for a lot of the earth players is gonna be chasing that nine trait. So if you get a plus two Noxus, Demacia, Shurima, anything like that, it's really, really easy to get to level nine and you're super stable at level nine. Even if it's just in the early stages of uh, five, one, five, one or five, two, you don't necessarily need to have all of your board upgraded. You just get to level nine. And if you have that plus two, then you can guarantee that you can stabilize just based on the chasing the nine trait. If you're in a bit of a weak opener, you can build up some econ and do a level seven all in as you can do this quite quickly because a lot of the other players will be greeting for that uh, fast eight. And so whilst they will have the advantage of getting to level eight, if you roll down on level seven earlier, you can actually save your game because all the forecasts will most likely still be in the pool and you can choose the one that you want. That being said though, if you're in a high roll position, most of the time I don't like rolling deep on seven, maybe a soft roll if you have to, because you should be rich enough that you can just go fast eight on either four one or four two. So just keep that in mind. And finally, a really important thing to note is that because you're getting an extra two experience when you level, normally you're getting four experience every time that you level, but instead because of the plus two, it's gonna be six. So everything is going to be uh, off interval. It's not going to be the same. So sometimes it'll be the same interval as previously, but just keep in mind that when you're leveling up, if you follow the standard leveling patterns that I've been showing in previous videos, this doesn't apply to Yumi's zoom zone. It is completely different. You can just check by looking at your EXP bar and see how much experience you need left. And if it's a multiple of six, then that's the interval what you want to level on if it's not a multiple of six then you usually want to wait to the next round because you'll natural that extra two and that'll enable it to be a multiple of six when playing in battle cafeteria obviously this is great for earth as any of those extra plus ones is going to enable you to get the plus two and just put you in a really good spot once you can eventually get to level eight something else to note is that you shouldn't commit your spatula on two one if you're lost streaking uh, you can still play the spatula on any random unit and feed the extra hp uh, but you don't need to actually slam the spat into anything because if you get a spatula on the first carousel then you're going to be in a much better spot than uh, anyone else and you can just slam that tactician's crown and you can just pretty much flex from there and play whatever you want make sure you scout around as a lot of players Players will lock in their comps on 2-1. You can pretty much guarantee what they're going to be playing if they slam their spatula. So just keep that in mind that if you are willing to play flexibly and just wait a little bit, wait until your Krugs items, uh, then you'll be in a much better position as a lot of people will be tunneled and they pretty much commit to their comps and they, they can't really pivot out of it. Um, give HP to units that are actually going to stick around. So a good example of this is that let's say you have an Aurelia 2 and then you slam an Ionia spat. There's no point in feeding the HP to the Aurelia, although it's helpful at the start of the game uh, because you know that Aurelia is going to be going because 
because when you're playing six Ionia, Aurelia is the unit that you drop. So make sure that you're feeding HP to units that are actually likely to stick around. And on top of that, make sure that you're not itemizing units that you think are going to stick around, but you don't want them on them later. So with the Ionia example, if you put all your items onto set, it's great. He's a really good tank. However, unfortunately, you do want those items to eventually go to Shen, and you don't want to have to sell that set and remake him, because if you're stacking up that extra HP from the Battle Cafeteria, then it's not ideal. So a lot of the times you can just itemize like an Aurelia or two, and then feed the HP to the set, and then once you get the Shen, you can just do the swap, and you'll be in a much better spot because of that. And if you do happen to get a random emblem from any of your traits or tomes or things like that, then make sure that you double feed the unit that's most important as you can actually double feed it if you have either two spatulas on one unit or you can just put two different units closest to the one that you want it to be fed. Moving on to build order, so starting out with Finn's Market, so of course you're getting extra items, so any of the items that you get from Augments are going to be slightly lower value, of course you can still take the Ezreal 2-1 if you want it. Um, keep in mind that it's random when you get them, but you are going to be guaranteed two, so keep a mental note of how many you've received throughout the game, because sometimes they come as late as uh, the end of stage 5, so if you keep a mental note of when one's coming, you can still play around it and keep an item slot somewhere where you think that it might fit. Support items don't stack super well, so I don't usually like to take the support dummy or the support items when I already know that I have a support item from Finn's Market, as there's not an amazing amount of synergy between them. Of course, I still take the silver one just because it's broken on 2-1. If you get a Radiant item, then the Radiant Augment itself actually goes up in value because having two Radiant items on your carry is obviously really good. And then playing around Demacia has similar kind of logic as if you get a Radiant item on your Demacia unit, plus you get the Radiant one from Finn's Market, then the multiplication that happens there is just going to be insane. So that's just something to keep in mind. With Rat Town, I hate to break it to you, but Mort Dog kind of lied. It's not just your tailored traits. You can also get your inactive traits uh, to tailor your lucky shops. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you're playing your strongest board. If you're playing any shooter units with really bad traits, then sometimes they will steal the Rat Town shops. Something else to note is that because you know that it's coming every single stage, is every single round that it doesn't appear, you know that it's increasingly more likely to be the next round, just statistically speaking. So make sure you're trying to tailor your board towards the end of a stage if you know that it's coming up soon. And also always tailor on neutrals because there's a chance that you get the first Rat Town shop uh, the next uh, stage. So for example, going into Wolves, uh, you can't even get back to back. So if you haven't had it for all of stage three and then going into Wolves, you get the Rat Town shops when you're about to verse the Wolves. It is possible to get back to back and then the next round on 4-1, you get another lucky shop. So that's why you should always be tailoring during neutrals. There's not too much to say about this region other than going for a three star three cost is a pretty smart way to try and secure a top four. However, if you're lucky and you're high rolling, you can try and push to level eight because three star four cost is usually going to be the way that you cap out with a first in this lobby. And don't be surprised when other players are going for it as well. So make sure that you're scouting around and holding on to deny those other four costs of those other players as it's very, very common that the player that wins this lobby is going to be the one with a three star four cost. With Slaughter Dogs, rerolling is really good because you can stay level 3 on 2-1 and just roll for your 1 cost 2 stars. Uh, and also, you can stay level 4 uh, when you get to stage 3 and then just roll back down. And usually, uh, after you use all of your free rolls, you can just keep rolling, hyper roll down, and you'll hit your 3 star uh, 1 cost. Uh, 2 costs are okay as well. You can level to 4 on 2-1 and then roll down for a, a couple of uh, 2 costs. And let's say you get, like, you're playing for a Jinx 3 star, then you can try and get a Jinx 2 very, very early into stage 2. And then, of course, you can level to 6 on 3-1 if you need to. And just roll back down for some more. I really don't like playing for a 3 star 3 cost. The reason is because you're going to be so broke if you level to 6 on 3-1 and try and pick up, let's say you're going for a Rek'Sai, try and pick up as many copies of Rek'Sai as you can. And if you do find Rek'Sai, great. Now you're broke because you have to hold on to all those extra ones. And yes, you get a really nice roll down on 4-1 as you'd be level 7. You get to roll down for all those Rek'Sai's, but you're just going to be so poor at that point. So there's two ways I'd play this game. Either go for a 1 or 2 cost 3 star or just try and push levels and get to level 8 because you'll have all those extra rolls on 5-1 that you can just roll down and try and find those extra two stars and the win con is always going to be a four cost three star because the rest of the lobby is probably going to be going for it as well even the ones who re-rolled the one and two cost they'll be level eight by the time it gets to stage five one and then on six one when you get even more re-rolls there's no point going to level nine if half the lobby is going for a three star four cost so you might as well just pick the one that you want and try and use it as your win con make sure that you're denying the rest of the lobby but your win con of course is just going to be hitting the three star four cost yourself Okay, so starting out with Demacia with House Light Shield. So this is an item that can go on either frontline or backline. Just keep in mind that it's very risky to place it on either one of your carries. So make sure that if you're putting it on your carries, you don't have to put it on planning phase. You can wait for the round to actually start, then place it on your backline. Make sure they're always in the corner so they're in the safest position possible. And only ever put it on frontline after the round starts and you know that your frontline unit is not likely to die. Uh, just keep in mind that 
the stats that you get from it are both AD and AP. So if you're putting it on, for example, a Sorcerer, they don't really need the extra AP and they don't really need the extra AD. This is why I try and lean into some of those comps which utilize more hybrid stats. For example, Kaisa scales really, really well with raw AP and should, because she's a challenger, she's still attacking quite fast and the AD is quite helpful on her as well. There's a couple of other champions that utilize AD well. So just make sure that when you're putting it on a unit, they have decent scaling on both sides. Otherwise, just chuck it on a frontline unit. It works really well in Bastion of Felios. If you put it on your Shen and your Shen doesn't die that quickly, your Felios can go infinite, but it is a very, very risky thing to put it on a frontline unit, so just keep that in mind. In Eren Mount, this is really, really good for tempo. One of the best reroll comps you can play in this region is Cho'Gath, because if you get two out of three Cho'Gath items, or if you're really lucky, three out of three, he's just an absolute menace in stage two. Keep in mind that unless you're playing Cho'Gath, you don't really want three defensive items, so make sure you manage your item economy well. For example, let's say that you get dropped a chain, a cloak, and a belt. Although you could pop those three anvils, and it might be tempting to go Warmog's Bramble Declaw, you have a really, really solid front line. Uh, the problem with this is if you go to Krugs and you get all defensive components, your game's basically over because it's going to be really hard to itemize your carry. So usually in this region, I try and make sure that I have one frontline item, one backline item, and then the third one's usually either utility or just another backline item, and that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that you're uh, considering your, what items you actually naturaled, as well as the items that you come from the component anvil, because the component anvils are actually similar to the carousels, where it doesn't get taken out of your item pool. So just make sure you're playing around your item economy and playing for a good solid stage two, because everyone is going to be very very strong and you want to keep up with the tempo of the lobby. Moving on to Freljord, we'll start off with Hearth Home. So this one is basically just a stats angle. You need to know which Radiant items are broken. And if you're playing the game on the fly, it's very easy to just have on a second monitor. Look up the comp that you're playing, look at the unit, and then just look at which Radiant items perform the best on them. A lot of the times people will just slam items uh, that make sense, and then they just Radiant whichever one they think looks good. But it's really important that when you're managing your item economy in this region, you're thinking about the fact that you're going to have a Radiant version of it, and make sure that you're always trying to lean towards that one. So some ones that come to mind is RFC on your Neela, Nash's on either your Azir or your Mordekaiser, uh, going for a either a Guardbreaker or a GS later into the game is obviously going to be good on a lot of your other carries. Some common bait that I see is people go Radiant Blue Buff on Silco, Radiant JG is pretty bad, and sometimes they go Radiant Redemption on their Cho'Gath when uh, usually you just want the Declaw because of the extra healing, it's a really broken item. Uh, so just keep that in mind, it's not that hard, you just look at the stats on the website and then you know exactly what you're playing for. The Orn's Forge is usually more safe to play around hybrid comps, that means AD and AP, just in case you low roll your Orn item, then at least it's easier to get some value out of it. It, it comes relatively early into the game, 2-5 or 3-5, so by that point, ideally you won't have three items on your main tank and you won't have three items on your main carry. This way you can utilize the Orn item and just put it on your, either your frontline or your backline, but most of the time, this early into the game, if you're going for a fast state, you're going to be pivoting your carries anyway, so it's not a big deal. Again, another stats angle, you can just look at which Orn items are broken on the uh, comps that you want to play. The ones that come to mind is like Sniper's Focus replaces an RFC if you're playing towards that Neela line. Uh, I think Zonya's is really good on Azir. DFG is okay in the Sorcerer line, but Mana Zane is absolutely broken. It basically replaces the blue buff. If you wanted to have a blue buff on any of your units, then a Mana Zane is just going to replace that. And then most of the frontline items are good. Keep in mind that the Econ ones are going to be better at stage 2-5 than they are going to be 3-5 just because Econ compounds. By the time you get to 3-5, you don't really need that extra economy. So just play around that. Moving on to Ionia, so start off with Placidium. Usually you want to go for the uncraftable ones, just because they're on average they cap a little bit higher, but there's nothing wrong with just going for a plus one Noxus or a plus one Shreema. It's very easy to play around. Uh, one tech that you can do is if you get a Piltover plus one on 2-1 and you start the game with three Piltover, you know that you're going to be getting another Piltover plus one, so this enables you to roll down a level seven, and you can guarantee that you have six Piltover on 3-5, and so you just get those extra plus two stacks. And let's say you get Tiny Titans, then on 4-1 if you cash out, you're going to have an insane cash out. But most of the time, you can just play six Piltover for one to two rounds, uh, and then you're going to be in a really, really good spot. High risk, high reward strategy, but it's very fun when you do hit. Another thing to note is Zorn. If you ever get a Zorn plus one in this region, it's really good because you know you can guarantee six Zorn, and that just gives you so many extra items. The problem I currently have with Zorn right now is if you don't get uh, the robotic arm, then when you're playing around the Jinx reroll, it just feels a lot weaker. But if you do get robotic arm, then six Zorn is absolutely broken on Jinx reroll. And something else to note is that you can guarantee a Void plus one. So let's say that you get a Void spat uh, offered on 2 1, then you can play around eight Void, which means you can play around the Baron, which is a pretty stable comp. But of course, even higher capping than that is if you 
you play around the reroll uh, void version so you can play around that rift herald and then because you have plus two it enables you to play four multicasters which as we know is very good in this patch in god's willow's grove it's very similar to placidium however you get to bench the shitter so don't upgrade the unit that you're keeping in that little spot as it makes you uh, more econ points uh, something to note is that if you can get to level eight and you have a plus two it's really really easy to hit the nine chase trait so if you can get to level eight and you have a plus two like shreem and noxus you can get to nine of that on level eight and you're going to be so stable on stage four if you can get there it's basically a guaranteed top two and then of course if you want to go nine you can otherwise you can just roll for a three star four cost uh, just make sure that you're not placing a unit in that corner hex on neutrals as sometimes you might want to sell the unit and you can't sell it once it's locked in so just keep that in mind with Dreaming Pool, you can guarantee that the unit you're going to get. So you know that you're going to be guaranteed a 2 cost, then a 3 cost, a 4 cost, and then it's just going to be 5 cost for the rest of the game. So it'll take uh, the trait that's the highest that you currently have. And let's say, for example, that you have 2 bruises on your board at 1-4, then you know that you're going to be getting a Vi. And so this is really good if you have 2 out of 3 Piltover, you can guarantee that Vi and get that 2-1 Piltover start, which is really good. Otherwise, if you just happen to get a couple of 2 costs, then usually you usually just want to go for a 2-star two, uh, two, 2 cost on 2-1, two, or you just get the one that fits your board. For example, if you have have a nice Ionia opener, then usually Warwick's the missing piece that you want because it gives you Juggernaut and Challenger. Make sure that you're playing around a three cost two star in the mid game because if you hold on to those three cost pairs, you can guarantee the three cost that you want on stage uh, three. Of course, you can't always guarantee it. For example, with Demacias, you could get sometimes a Quinn or a Sonar, or if you're going for Slayers, then you could get a Quinn or a Rek'Sai. Uh, but you can play towards certain lines which only have one three cost of a certain trait and then just stick to that. Something else that's really important to note is that you're pretty much guaranteed the four cost that you want uh, on stage four. So just make sure that you're holding onto the units and just play around that. You can actually change your board on 2-1 after you choose your augment. So for example, let's say that you were trying to tailor and get a bruiser. You play two bruisers on 1-4 and then you see your augment and you choose something that's like juggernaut or something that's just far away from bruisers. You can actually switch up your board so that you don't get that Vi and it'll actually take into account what you're currently playing because the unit doesn't spawn until you choose your augment. So that's something really important to note. And something else that's really important to note is that you can hold on to shitter units just onto your bench and then play them during neutrals and guarantee exactly what you want. A uh, one that comes to mind is Aatrox. So Aatrox fits into a lot of comps and a lot of the times you want him. However, if you're not playing uh, a bunch of Slayers or you're not playing a bunch of Juggernauts, you can hold on to those Juggernauts or Slayers on your bench and then just play them onto your board later and that'll just guarantee that you get the Aatrox. So make sure that you're tailoring and of course if there's not a unit with that cost that matches your current highest trait it just goes down to the next one so for example if you're playing six challengers uh, on neutrals before raptors then there's no five cost challenger so you're not actually going to get a challenger it'll just go down and look at the next one so let's say you're playing six challengers and two juggernaut then if juggernaut's the next highest trait that you have active it'll just take the juggernaut and give you an aatrox I'm not even going to bother to try and pronounce this region, but here we want to be playing around hybrid units because if you try and get to the later stage of the game and you get that Radiant item, then if you get an AP1 and you're playing only AD, then it's going to be bad and vice versa. Holding on to Removers and Reforgers are really, really crucial in this region because you can get absolutely screwed over uh, by your Radiant item. If you don't even have a Remover, then you can't put it on the unit that you want. And if you don't have a Reforger, a lot of the time you can just low roll your Radiant item. So that's something to keep in mind. Obviously, Augments that give you items are going to be slightly less desirable because you're naturally in them anyway, but there's not too much else to say about this region. In Cardinal Arcology, uh, Earth is obviously broken, as I mentioned in my previous video. You're getting the free plus one, and then you know that the spatula is coming, so you can just play around that. As for the rest of the players, uh, you just need to know that on 4-2, you are going to be getting the Prismatic, so play around the fact that you might hit level up, uh, so don't waste all your gold if you think that that's coming and it fits well into your spot. Uh, if you think that you can utilize binary well, it's sometimes okay to just create that one extra round, uh, not putting three items on your main tank or three items on your main carry if you think that binary is really, really good in your spot. So it's just little things like that. Look at the augments that you think that you might want and just play around that. Although there's not too much to say about this region because other than that, it's pretty stale. With Serpentine, we have Democracy. Well, kind of. People can still rig the elections. But regardless, it's important to know what you should be voting for. So for starting off with the component, you only want to vote for the component when you have either zero or two or more. You don't want to vote for it when you already have one component because you're guaranteed a component. So getting two of them is not going to do anything because you already get a guaranteed slam. And then the second one's just going to be sitting on your bench doing absolutely nothing. You want to vote for gold when you're low on econ because hitting those early thresholds is more important than when you're rich. Let's say you're already sitting on 40 gold, then don't vote for gold because it's not going to help you to get much more gold, but it is going to be helping the rest of the lobby. 
Obviously, vote for HP if you're low on life. It's not super important if you think you're going for a win out. Obviously, if you're playing around like Piltover and you want extra HP, but most of the time, uh, you only want to vote for HP if it's going to give you an extra life. What I mean by that is like, let's say you're 20 HP, you don't necessarily need to vote for HP because getting that little bit of extra boost, you're still probably going to be two lives in stage five anyway. Uh, so there's not really too much point. However, let's say you're sitting on like 17 HP, then voting for HP is good because it's going to ensure that you get two lives. And then also save your rerolls. I know of some pretty high ranked challenger players who didn't know that you could save your rerolls because a lot of the other rerolls that we get in the different regions you have to use them on that turn but no if you get rerolls then you can just use them whenever okay i actually thought about wait you can I... bank these yeah you want to vote for rerolls when you want to use them soon so for example if you're going fast seven or fast eight and you don't think you need to reroll because your board's already upgraded, don't give away free rerolls to the rest of the lobby. However, if you think that you're going to reroll in the next couple of turns, then obviously use it because it's going to give you tempo where other people will be greeting. In Immortal Bastion, this is a pretty boring region. Obviously, Piltover is going to be slightly better as you have one to two extra lives. Uh, but you don't really change the way that you play this game. A lot of people think, oh, it's I have an extra 15 HP, I can greed a little bit more, I can take, you know, econ augments and then just go for the, like, level 8 all-in. But... To be honest, you just play the game the exact same way. There's no point in throwing away extra HP because 15 is not actually that significant. The only thing that changes is that people are going to be dying on average one to two rounds later. So just play the game exactly as you would have previously and don't get um, baited into going for the fast eight. With Flushing Arena, this is an econ portal, so ideally you should be trying to play Fast 8 in most of your games. I don't like rerolling because the Fast 8 players get access to all of these extra 3 and 4 costs that are going to be super helpful for their board, and it allows them to stabilize when they otherwise would have had to roll a little bit deeper. Because you're getting that extra econ from these units, you should be rich enough to either uh, go level 7 on 3-5 and just soft roll until you're stable, or go for a Fast 8 on 4-2. Regardless, you should always be making it to level 8 on either 4-5 or 5-1 at the absolute latest. In Noxtria, usually melee carries are slightly better, so playing around like Fiora or Mordekaiser, it's just better because they can move around and be a bit more flexible with their position. However, there's so many bad hexes when you're playing back to front. Also, if you're playing around Kaisa, she's a really good example of a unit that is a backline carry, but because she dashes around, you can put her in a lot of backline hexes and it's fine. However, if you're playing units such as Quinn or Aphelios, a lot of the times you'll grief them if you put them in the center middle, as a lot of the times they want to be in the corner just so that they're a bit safer. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing your comp. Of course, sometimes you just have to play the back to front comps because that's the hand that you were given. Uh, but usually you want to lean towards those melee carry comps and play around some of those extra lines. In Stillwater, it's actually kind of hard to play this region, despite the fact that it is the most basic one and boring one, is because people are used to playing around their augments. And so the fact that no one has any augments just makes the game feel really, really awkward. You are getting those extra items, so make sure that when you're picking them up, uh, you're, you're managing your item economy well. So not picking up too many frontline items and not picking up too many backline items, despite the fact that no one has any augments which locks them into certain comps you can usually tell what people are leaning towards just based on their item slams so make sure that you're scouting and just playing around that of course no one's going to have any econ augments so it's very hard to go fast eight yet alone even make it to level nine until really really late into the game so this means that you're going to be having to roll down on level seven in a lot of your games because a lot of the other players are going to be doing that as well especially the ones who have lower hp if you're streaking and doing really really well that of course you can go for the fast eight but i'd say most of the time you're soft rolling on seven just to give you some direction and make sure that you're scouting because players are going to be so obvious with the items that they slam as to what comps that they want to play uh, but just keep in mind that certain comps that really rely on augments are obviously going to be less meta uh, the ones that come to mind are some of the reroll comps that need those uh, reroll augments so for example if you're playing around the multicasters and you don't have the guaranteed items that you want or you don't have any reroll augments such as golden ticket then it's going to be really, really hard to actually stabilize and so that's why i would usually just stick to a standard cookie cutter line of playing fast eight with a soft roll on seven in the university, make sure you're scouting around for the Cruel Pact player. If you get offered Cruel Pact, unless you have huge balls, I wouldn't take it if someone else already has Cruel Pact. And most of the time, the comps are going to be locked in pretty early, as there's a lot of augments which just dictate what someone's going to be playing for the rest of the game. Uh, on 2-1, you can already figure that out. Of course, there is a small chance that you get Triple Prismatic, but most of the time, you're actually going to be getting Silver at 3-2, so just play around that. Um, and just keep in mind that obviously boards are going to be capping really, really high if you already know that there's a guaranteed one prismatic. So just try not to lose too much HP uh, in stage 2 1. And if there is a cruel packed player in your lobby, then everyone's going to be dying a lot sooner. So just play around that. Usually it means you need to roll a little bit deeper on seven if you weren't streaking and doing well in the mid game. So with Jace's workshop, everything that I said about the university obviously applies here as well, except there's two different ways that this lobby is going to go down. So if there's a cruel packed player, then of course everyone's going to be dying off uh, sooner. However, a lot of the prismatic augments allow you to cap super high. 
So if there's no uh, Cruel Pact player, a lot of the times players will actually greed, and you need to kind of adjust your playstyle to the lobby to actually match the tempo. Because if you're playing pure tempo and just everyone else is greeting, then they're all going to outcap you. And if you're doing the reverse, where you're the only one greeting and everyone else is playing Cruel Pact and just combat augments, and you're taking infinite HP every single round, then you're just going to bleed out before you can ever get to the spot that you want to be in. So make sure when you're playing in a triple prismatic lobby, you're getting a feel for the lobby and playing accordingly. With Yorick's Graveyard, hybrid comp's obviously good. You want to make sure that you have a second or a third carry as if you're making it into the later stages of the game then you're going to be getting those extra items that you want to put onto the second and third carry the cyber value is obviously going to be higher as if you get any of the cyber augments you're going to have so many items that you're going to be getting a lot of value out of it make sure you're scouting the hp of the lower players and when you see that they're getting close to lethal make sure you're looking at their items and figuring out what you're going to be getting as you know that you're going to be getting a choice of quite a lot of the different items that they have on board and so most of the time this can dictate whether or not you want to pick up a certain other item from carousel uh, that complements your board uh, as well and also don't buy a unit as soon as you see it flash in front of your eyes if you know that someone's just died because it's a very very common thing where you'll see like a fiora two star in your shop and you go to click it and then the yorick's graveyard will pop up and then you'll accidentally pick that item so just keep that in mind with thresh's sanctum you can sack units you can actually let your kale die if you play kale at the front and center and then move your poppy or another bastion unit to the back right however this is determined based on crits so if kale crits then sometimes she won't die but a lot of the time she can die most of the time with neutrals you just want to sack as many units as possible to get that counter up make sure you're standing where the gold spawns so in the top left corner of your screen make sure your little legend sitting there because a lot of the time you're going to get gold and if the round ends before you your little legend actually picks up that gold or that champion you can't sell it uh, before the round starts and so you're going to miss out on econ and sometimes you even get items coming out of the portal and you want to make sure that you're slamming items during the middle of your round if it changes the outcome of your fight so just keep that in mind as a default just get into the habit of putting your little legend in the top left corner of your screen and ideally you're winning by not too much uh, but not too, too little because uh, both the opponent's units that die as well as yours are going to be counting towards your counter but it's not something that really matters because if you're winning by a lot of units it's good you're dishing out more damage to the lobby so don't worry about that too much if you're playing around like void opener it's really good because you're going to have the um uh, void link dying as well so that's going to be adding to the counter but i wouldn't change your game too much around this just play your strongest board uh, moving on to Sharima, we have Warlords. So obviously you want to make sure that you save some gold for 5 ones. you can roll down for an ideal combination. This means that even if you're going 8 on 4-5, you're not sending it all the way down to 0. And of course, if you can afford to, you usually want to leave an item slot on either your carry or your secondary carry, because if you get a Radiant item option, you always want to make sure that it's going on your main carry. Also, make sure you make Econ uh, on the Treasure Dragon. So after you get your items and you choose, usually this is the time when you roll down and pivot your board, but there's actually a little bit of time that happens, and then you get Econ and your shops will change. So keep this in mind, if you have like 50 gold, you don't want to spend it all at once, you want to wait for that timer to tick, and you'll get a little bit more gold. And if you're playing around either Pandora's Bench or Pandora's items just be really really careful because sometimes you can stuff it up you choose your radiant treasure dragon and you get something really really good and then you have pandora's items and it changes or if you're playing around bench and you have some units or something that you didn't buy the bench will also switch as well so just keep that in mind there is a little bit of a delay as you move into 5-1 as opposed to when you're staying in 4-6 you're playing in Shreemus Bazaar and you're lose tricking, it's much, much more acceptable to not make an item on 2-1. If you don't really like any of the items, then that's perfectly fine. In a normal game, it means that if you don't slam an item on 2-1, you're not going to be making two items until Krugs, which is really bad for your uh, early game. However, in Shreemus Bazaar, obviously you can fix your item economy. Make sure that you're not going too ham on either the front line or the back line. Keep your item economy good as you want to have a nice mix of front line and back line items. And you can always try and find that extra component that you need later, as unless you get turbo mort dogs, most of the time you're going to be able to get just one of the components that you need and so just keep that in mind that you don't necessarily need to uh, tunnel vision on that bis of one certain carry as you can be a little bit more flexible as you know that you're going to be having lots of extra components coming in later with Shifting Sands, uh, it's really good to play around one-cost rerolls if you natural a lot of them, as uh, it's really easy to play Cho'Gath if you just natural a bunch of one-cost upgrades, buy everything that you see, and then just put them on the bench, and eventually, ideally, it will turn into Cho'Gath, Cassio, or uh, Renekton. Um, if you're not playing a one-cost reroll, then I highly recommend that you just go for a fast eight, as the win con in this lobby is almost always going to be a uh, three-star four-cost. The reason for this is because on level seven, you can just roll down, buy a bunch of four-costs, and then chuck them on the bench. One strategy that a lot of players will implement is 
by rolling very, very deep on level 7 and rolling for a 2-star uh, forecast, a random one, and then just putting it on the bench. I'm not a huge fan of this strategy. I think this is more of a desperation play, as most of the time, I'm just going to be rolling down and just trying to hit a couple of forecasts and then uh, turn them into the ones that I need. If I need to, I'll roll really deep once I hit my pair. Let's say I'm playing Mordekaiser and I hit Mordekaiser pair from the bench. Then I can roll back down on level 7 until I hit the 2-star and stabilize. But basically, every single game, you're looking for a 3-star forecast, as that's probably what's going to win you the lobby. Because you're holding on to all these extra units, uh, going to level 9 is not super realistic, so I wouldn't recommend level up, and I wouldn't recommend playing around that fast 9 uh, playstyle. And also, don't re-roll units. You don't have to re-roll units every single round. If you think that is low value, it's better to just make Econ, and then you can roll the units later. And Targon Prime, of course, playing for the win out is going to be better as you're going to be getting that extra stimmy bonus when you drop down to the 40 HP. So comps such as Piltover are going to be really good as well as other reroll comps where usually you'd go quite low HP before you actually start winning any rounds. But if you have a strong opener, do not throw it away. You do not need to greed uh, super hard in this region as you're going to be getting the stimmy anyway. So saving HP, as long as it's not at the detriment of a lot of econ, is definitely still going to be worthwhile. Make sure that you're scouting because you can see what the package is going to be. If you look at the player who drops below 40 HP, you can just go scout over to their board and see what they get. It is crucial that you know what it is because a lot of the times it'll be something like a spatula and you need to be playing around the fact that you know a spatula is coming your way as uh, of course as soon as people recognize that it's going to be a spatula, everyone's going to be going for spatulas on the carousels because they know that they can get a free tactician's crown. But let's say that you can't get that because you're wind streaking and you're playing around Noxus, then you want to make sure that you're holding onto that belt because you know that uh, a Noxus spat is coming your way. In Marisol Magnum, everyone dies earlier. Everyone's going to be taking more damage because there's more units on the field. So just keep that in mind that the game is going to end a lot sooner. Because you have a plus two, it's a lot easier to go for the chase traits. So if you get um, a plus two spats, you can easily fit in nine Noxus. Even on level seven, you don't even have to get to level eight. Um, and most of the time, you are going to be stuck on level seven until you're actually stable. Because everyone's going to be rolling and dying relatively early. Uh, so make sure that you're not greeting a fast eight unless you natural a lot of upgrades and you're super stable. Most of the time, you're rolling pretty deep on level 7 until you think that you're kind of stable uh, because the game's going to be over by the time you even get to level 8 at that point anyway as most players will be dying in the early stages of stage 5 some might even die in stage 4 so just make sure that you're keeping up with the lobby tempo uh, don't greed your opener do try not to go for a 5 loss because 5 loss in this region is really really risky in the summit everyone's getting access to these uh, 3 cost duplicators so whilst you can play 1 and 2 cost rerolls I wouldn't really recommend it because at the same time that you're going to be hitting your 3 star 1 cost there's going to be other players in the lobbies who are hitting their uh, 3 cost cost three stars the win con in this game is always going to be a, a four cost three star similar to some of the other regions because you're getting those extra duplicators later into the game so make sure in stage five you're scouting out to see who's the closest to hitting their four cost three star and then try to deny that unit most of the time, you're not going to be able to get to level 9 because you're rolling quite deep in some of the earlier uh, stages. Uh, however, if you're just stuck on level 8 and you have decent econ, it's really, really important that you have enough econ so you can get to the point that once you get that extra duplicator on 5-1 and 6-1, if you haven't already used the first one, you have such an easy time getting a 4 cost 3 star. So just roll back down after stage 6 and then you can go for the win con that way. But just make sure that you're scouting and denying as many 4 cost 3 stars as you can. Moving on to the void, we'll start off with the rupture. I guess just go to the timestamp that matches the location you land. And in Hall of the Nine, of course, you're gonna be getting a whole bunch of random stuff, but in a lot of your games, you're gonna be getting tomes, spatulas, and uh, tactician's crowns. So when you get a tactician's crown and you're getting all these extra spatulas, your win con is almost always going to be getting to level eight and then just playing a uh, nine of a certain chase trait. So you're playing like nine Noxus, Shreema, as all the ones that I've mentioned before. Make sure that when you're getting these extra spatulas, you're holding onto them. In a lot of the spots, I will use my reforger to reforge the spatula if I think I really need an extra component just to give me that tempo. But in a lot of the spots, I regret it because you still get spatulas later into the game. Even once you can't get any more components uh, from neutrals after 5-1, on 6-1, you'll randomly just get another spatula. So just keep that in mind that because you know that there's a high chance that you're getting another spatula later into the game, if you're leaving a dead component on your bench, let's say after 5-1, you have an odd number of components, you want to make sure that, that that odd component that gets left over on your bench is something that would be helpful. So if you're playing Noxus, you would leave a belt because it will give you that free Noxus spat if you happen to get another spatula later. And of course, you're just going to be making sure that you're trying to get to that 9 chase trait. Getting to level 9 is obviously good in this region, but if you already have the Tactician's Crown, then the win con is always going to be the chase trait. With Unstable Rift, there's not too much to say. Hybrid comps are good, especially in the early and mid game. If you can utilize both AD and AP items, you're going to be in a much better spot. Make sure you have secondary uh, carries that you can put that third item on later into the game. Obviously, you want to make sure that you have a three item carry for consistency in the late game, but it doesn't hurt to have a secondary carry who has two out of three items.
In Zorn, we have the Sump, which is basically just go fast 7, play tempo, and then you're just donkey rolling on level 7 until you're stable. Never get baited into fast 8 in the Sump. The reason is because if you go fast 8, yes, you're still getting Econ from the Sump, but you're getting extra 2 experience every single round that you do not have access to. Because it's really, really hard to get to level 9 in this region, going to level 8 first doesn't really change anything. It's much better to roll deep on 7 until you actually hit some of your upgrades and you're relatively stable. There's another strategy you can play where you stay low level and just keep re-rolling on level 3 because obviously you don't have to hold on to any uh, econ interest and you can just play for a 3-star uh, 1 cost. Uh, however, I don't really agree with this strategy because you don't have that much gold and you're rolling on level 3. Yes, that's good, but you're using up so much gold in the early game when other people are just going to be pushing levels and just out-tempoing you. I'm not a big fan of this region, but that's how you play it. Another thing to note is that if you natural 1 cost 2 stars uh, in the early game before you even get into stage 2, then you can pre-level before stage 2 to get some of those extra units, because you're pretty much always going to be leveling anyway, so there's nothing wrong with that. In Eclipse, you're getting obviously a lot of extra gold, so the way you play the game is usually just trying to get to that fast 8 uh, on 4-2. Of course, you're going to be rich enough to go level 7 on 3-5 and just roll down if you're low rolling. However, the worst thing you can do is when contested, if you're indecisive about what you want to do and you realize that you don't actually have enough money to go 8 on 4-2 and so you just send all your gold on 4-1, the players who went to level 7 and rolled on 3-5 are going to already have taken your units and then you're going to get outcapped by the players who went fast 8 on 4-2 because they capped with legendaries. So just make sure that you're not indecisive in this region and you're just sticking to one of those two strategies. I really don't like augments such as Rich Get Richer in this region because the extra gold that you're getting is backloaded. So by the time you get the gold and you can make 70 gold, it's way too late. And also it doesn't actually change your game. If you have a combat augment and you win streak, you're still rich enough to go 8 on 4-2, which is what Rich Get Richer enables you to do anyway, but you would have just been 40 HP. So that's why I think Rich Get Richer has some merit in other econ galaxies, but not in this one because it's way too backloaded. In Glass, obviously Ezreal, all of his augments on 2-1 are going to be Biss as you're getting a lot of extra money when you make those items. You can slam items uh, on 1-4 to guarantee that you make 10 gold, or you can just slam items so that you can hold on to more units. This also works on other neutral rounds as if you're playing on, for example, like Wolves or Raptors, you can make that extra final item and then just guarantee that you hit the extra Econ Interval. Just be a little bit uh, careful with this. A lot of the times I'll have a Sunfire Cape and I know that I'm going to slam, slam Sunfire Cape every time, but then you get uh, an augment option such as Red Buff and you go, oh, maybe I actually would have rather to take that so only do it if if you're in a really certain spot that just enables it um, but it is a cool little trick that you can do if you want to try and make plus one gold in this region you're obviously playing for tempo as the greedy win out playstyle doesn't work super well as just slamming items and keeping up with the rest of the lobby is going to make you money uh, not only from the items but also just winning rounds and saving hp it's just going to be put you in a much better spot so that's why i always like to take either item augments on stage two or combat augments to keep me up ahead with the rest of the lobby and make sure that my tempo is high okay Okay, finally, that is all of the regions. I hope I didn't miss any. If I did, then roast me down in the comments below. Uh, but I hope you guys did enjoy learning about my insights about all of the different regions that we have here in TFT. It's really crucial that you're playing to your environment, as I've mentioned in many other previous videos. So hopefully this will enable you to go first in more of those different regions that you weren't super comfortable with. That's all for me for today, guys. I hope you guys did enjoy. Make sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more of this content and leave me some comments about what you guys want to see next. All right, bye for now.